Good evening, BS and beer enthusiasts. Uh, welcome to the weekly installment, this week's installment of the BS and beer show. Of course, BS stands for building <clears throat> science, as you all know. I'm Travis Brungart. I am going to uh, do my best Mike Maine's impression tonight. I'll see if I can keep it together and not burn the ship. Uh, but he'll be back next week, and I think he's in the audience anyway. So as long as I don't screw this up royally, uh, it'll all be fine. Um, I am drinking tonight my local, one of my local favorites, uh, BKS Artisan Ales. This is a passion fruit margarita, but it's still a beer. It's just a sour beer, which I always drink now specifically because I know how much Emily hates them. Uh, it's, it's just added fun for me. Um, I'm with Emily. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Well, whatever you're drinking, I encourage you to drink it with friends and to discuss building science with them uh, at the same time. We are doing our best to spread the BS far and wide, but if you have any questions about starting a local discussion group, uh, definitely get in touch with us through this venue or any other uh, social media outlet. Mike Maines helped me get mine started, and uh, it's been off to the races ever since. So let us know if we can offer you a resource to help with that. Um, certainly, we want to take a minute to thank Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine, who are our media partners in hosting this. Uh, and then I guess I'll introduce the topic. Tonight, we're talking about choosing and using water resistive barriers. And with that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Brian Pontalillo. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Brian Pontalillo from um, Green Building Advisor and, and Fine Home Building Magazine. Um, so, Tonight we're going to have pretty, mostly we're going to have a, an open conversation about uh, water resistant barriers. Um, the way it'll work though, before um, before we get into that into that kind of free form conversation, I'll do a little bit of an introduction to the topic, and I'll start that in a little bit. I have some cobbled together some slides from past presentations that I can use, um, and I think it we will come back to me in a moment. But I'm going to pass off to Emily for now to introduce uh, tonight's panelists. All right, guys, Emily Matram, architect here in uh, Maine. Most of you know me. Uh, uh, this was so good last week after the bad sour beer that I thought it needed to make a reappearance. So tonight we're having Marsh Island Brewing Pulp Truck, which is an IPA, which is usually my choice uh, on here. So uh, they're another local brewery and great. And uh, in all honesty, if you like sour beers, I understand the one from last week was excellent. So if you come to Maine, Oxbow Brewing, uh, it Catalyst is supposed to be excellent, just not my thing. Um, also wanted to point out we have an email list here so if you want weekly reminders about what the next upcoming topic is or a reminder to pop on the show at six o'clock uh, join at the bsmbeershow.com you can join our mailing list uh, but tonight we have two exceptional guests we have ben bogey ben is a second generation high performance builder um, he's been working as a production manager for Colbert Building. He has over 20 years of job site experience, ranging from conservation work of the early 18th century homes that we have here in Maine to cutting edge, low energy houses and high end custom mill work. Uh, he's also known to me as Building Science Mike 2.0 or Fine Home Building Ben. Uh, he's one of my go to educators on building science knowledge. So make sure you check out his recent articles on Fine Home Building. Then we have Jake Bruton. Uh, Jake is a builder and remodeler in Columbia. Is it Missouri or Missouri? It's Missouri. All right, good. Uh, he is the owner of Arrow Building and uh, for more than a decade, growing up remodeling and repairing business uh, positioned him for success when building because of the vast amount of time fixing and repairing, replacing the mistakes of previous methods of construction. All this repair work has driven Jake to educate himself on building science and learn to apply those ideas in his high performance projects. I also recently learned that Jake is the kind of building science nerd that needs to own two blower doors, not just one. So uh, don't forget to tune in <laughs> to his Unbuild It podcast with Steve and Peter. Uh, great work there uh, that they're putting out. So I am going to turn it back over to, uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to let Ben and Jake introduce what they're drinking and any other little tidbits you'd like to share about yourself or your backgrounds. Uh, like I said, I am drinking a... Uh, Old fashioned with uh, Old Forester bourbon and the good 
uh, maraschino cherries, not, not the uh, bright red ones that are nasty. Uh, <laughs> that's a key for a good old fashioned. Uh, I have to admit, I was hoping that Emily would uh, just read Ben's bio a second time and just put my name at the front of it. It was so good. <clears throat> so like Emily said, we're, uh, we're a builder in Columbia, Missouri. This is a market where uh, I spent two and a half hours calling every appraiser within four hours drive of Columbia because we took a project to a bank last week and the, uh, the appraiser didn't even send the appraisal back. He just sent a question saying, are you sure you want me to appraise this? Because there's no way it's going to appraise what it costs to build this. The energy efficiency stuff doesn't matter in our market. And I was like, oh, wow, I guess we'll call every appraiser that I can find. And every single one I called said, a certified green appraiser, what is that? An AGA appraiser, what is that? So we're, we're in the middle of nowhere here. We don't get to build in Portland, Maine. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yes, all right. So let me just close my preferences here. So tonight I am drinking uh, Brazen from Foundation Brewing. It's a, let's see, it's a Imperial Pale Ale with lactose added. So it's got a nice smooth swallow. Um, yeah, I don't know really what else to say. Uh, you're catching me sitting here and where I spend most of my days, which is our shop um, or on job sites. I've been at this for well, collecting a paycheck at this for 21 years now. Uh, grew up in it. Like I said, my father was an early adopter of high performance, so I grew up with building science and those kind of techniques kind of just drilled into me from an early age. Never realized that other people weren't doing the things that we did until I kind of got out uh, professionally and started seeing the, the state of the industry. Um, I have a hard time shutting my brain off, so I'm constantly reading and researching and learning and just diving into all aspects of the trade, um, be that antique machinery, uh, old woodworking techniques, uh, new high-tech products that are coming out onto the market. And I just, I have a memory that holds on to it. So that allows me to kind of be in this position where I get to speak to all of you and have this conversation, which is so valuable for all of us. So uh, take it away, Brian. Great. Welcome tonight. And uh, Brian's going to lead us into an intro here. And yeah, thanks for having us too, by the way. Yeah, we're thrilled. And, um, you know, this WRBs, Water Resistant Barriers, are, it, it's an interesting topic in, in a whole lot of ways. And, you know, one of the things that's just so interesting about it is how huge the category has gotten. I thought before I was um, thinking about you know what this introduction should be tonight. I just started scribbling down on this piece of paper some names of products, and and, and in you know in, in a minute I had you know well over a dozen products in, in all these different categories written down. And this innovation, I think, is is um, well. There's a lot of reasons for this. There's a lot of reasons why the category is expanding at such a rapid rate. You know, part of it is uh, product innovation. Uh, part of it is um, our, our products that have been around for a while that are coming uh, across the Atlantic from Europe, and that 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 you know, our building industry is just getting acquainted with. And part of it is uh, products coming from the uh, commercial world into the residential world, um, particularly the uh, fluid applied products. So it's fascinating in that way. Uh, and, and, yet, and yet, in a lot of ways, the, 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 what we're looking to do with this product is, is also very simple. So with that, I'm going to, um, in one second here, I will share my screen with you all. And I have, like I said, I have some slides uh, cobbled together from uh, from some other presentations. Can you all see that? Looks good. Okay, so just run through, um, and I, I did, maybe I already said this, but this is sort of, this is um, admittedly going to be a very entry level introduction to choosing a WRB, and hopefully it will set the stage for a more detailed and nuanced discussion that will come afterwards. Um, so we can't talk about choosing a WRB without talking about the four control layers of, um, of a building assembly, in this particular case, a wall. Um, there's four things that we need to control with our, with our um, wall assemblies. They're water, air, vapor, and temperature or thermal control. And um, a WRB can help with a few of these control layers, um, but we have to consider that water always comes first. 
Um, and that, that's why it's called the WRB, because the most important role that it plays is to keep water out of our assemblies. And, and I just, you know, I, I wrote about these products last year in a few different articles, and I, I collected, you know, these are just a few of the great quotes I collected about how important it is that we are controlling water. So the water control layer must come first. Um, the components of the water control layer are numerous. Of course, we have, you know, the roof, for example, is a, is a uh, part of the water control layer and roof overhangs that are shedding water away from the building, um, as well as some of these other uh, things listed here. But what covers the largest, um, you know, square footage of the building in the water control layer is going to be uh, the water resistant barrier or the WRB. And it is um, written into the IRC that it is required that we have a WRB on our buildings. And let's just look quickly at uh, what the uh, prescriptive portions of the IRC have to say about that. Um, so the only product named in the IRC is uh, asphalt felt, and it's specifically ASTM D226 uh, type one asphalt felt. Um, it, IRC describes how it needs to be continuous, how it can't have holes, how it needs to be uh, integrated with um, flashings. And then, of course, it, it, the code language gives the caveat or other approved products. So by other approved products, um, uh, the, the code means two things. Um, the first thing that it means is approved by the ICCES, so the, the um, International Code Council's Evaluation Service. So any product likely that you're going to find um, sold, marketed as a water resistant barrier will have met the acceptance criteria of the ICCES for that product category. Um, so there's different categories for mechanically fastened products, for uh, integrated sheathing products, for fluid applied products. But you can, you can find that information on their website and that, that's good to know. The other definition of approved, um, and this is, this is getting down now to the local level, uh, Glenn Matthewson told me when I was researching this topic that when the, when the IRC uses the word approved, what, it, uh, what matters the most is that your local billing inspector approves it. So those ICCES um, reports that you can find on these products, they're great. You can use them. You can bring them to your billing inspector, but it's, it's, it's still the billing official's call. So another control layer that the WRB can help with is air control. And so we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a moment. After, after you have decided what product you're gonna use uh, for your for water control layer, how you're gonna integrate that with the rest of your water control layer and your uh, water management details, you can choose to also use your WRP um, as part of the air control. And again, this, can, this is what a lot of builders are, are doing now with the WRP because you can't cover lots of the building. Um, in a very, uh, in a more effortless way than maybe some other approaches to um, air sealing your house by using a water resistant barrier product as that portion of your air control layer. And then finally, it can, your WRB can help with vapor control. And vapor control is more, is a more nuanced control than water or air. Typically with water and air, we're simply trying to keep those things from passing through the assembly, right? We're trying to keep uh, rain out of the assembly. We're trying to keep air from passing um, from one side of the assembly into the assembly, through the assembly. It was a little bit more nuanced because we may need to control vapor drive from one side of the assembly to the other, but we also want to make sure that our assemblies can dry. So we may also want to allow vapor drive. Um, we may actually, you know, be doing um, anything from stopping it in one direction to allowing it in another direction to, to keeping our our walls um, as, as vapor open in every direction as possible, and that depends on the type of assembly. But again, your WRV can, can help with this. Um, I think it's most common that we want, on many walls, that we want as vapor open of the WRV as possible to allow outward drying from that wall. But that's not always the case. There are cases in certain climates and with certain siding types where we might want a vapor closed WRB to prevent inward vapor drive, or we may have a building assembly where it doesn't quite matter if we have a vapor open WRB or not. Say that's the WRB behind um, a vapor closed rigid foam insulation. You, you have a vapor closed exterior anyway, so at that point it becomes less relevant uh, the perm rating of your WRB. Um, 
So you can, it's definitely something to look at and be aware of. Uh, many WRVs, if not most, are in this vapor permeable material category. In other words, greater than 10 perms. Uh, I was told when I was doing some research by one of the principals at RDH Building Science that above, um, above 10 perms, there's really not an, as long as you're above 10 perms, there's not a really appreciable difference in, um, in the, the rate of diffusion. So for example, you might have, um, you might be choosing between um, they're dissimilar products, but you might be choosing between Tyvek and Zip. And uh, Tyvek is uh, vapor open to 50 perms, and uh, the WRB on the Zip sheathing is about 12 or 14 perms. And what um, what I what what Michael told me, Michael's uh, the principal at RDH that I spoke with, told me that really, as long as you're above 10 perms, you're you're in pretty safe. You're in a pretty safe zone. So uh, with that, uh, we'll just cruise through the categories. I think you all are probably. Um, aware of these, pretty well aware and acquainted with these categories. The sort of the um, the main category of WRV is still mechanically fastened house wraps. Um, builders, a lot of builders like them because it makes shingle style lapping and integration with all your flashings um, pr a pretty straightforward and, and uh, possible um, process. Um, mechanically fastened WRVs aren't the best uh, air barrier. Uh, although they are they are typically airtight materials, um, it can be really challenging to detail them well as an air barrier. Uh, drainable house wraps are mostly, um, at least for now. I think we have some new products coming out soon. But drainable house wraps are generally also mechanically fastened, and these are the products with grooves, dimples, and spacers that create a little bit of a gap behind your siding that allow water to drain. It's an important distinction. To be aware of with drainable house wraps is that these are not vent creating ventilated rain screens. Um, they might be the next best thing to a ventilated rain screen because they allow some drainage, but they do not create the same type of ventilation in the true ventilation uh, cavity, ventilated cavity. Um, did generally, um, and I don't, I actually don't know how true this is anymore if you really look at the broad spectrum, but generally these would be a step up in cost uh, to mechanically fastened products, although there are some pretty costly mechanically fasten products available now. Um, we're all very well aware of um, zip sheathing, although it's, it, it has a couple competitors in the market. Now I've yet to see any of the competitors on an actual build, but they're, they're out there from, um, from LP in Georgia Pacific uh, making very similar products. And, and of course, this is a product that a lot of people like because of the workflow with it. It sort of can get you your structural sheathing, your water resistant barrier, um, you're in your air barrier, all in a very um, straightforward workflow. And we know that a lot of builders are, are having a lot of success, particularly with, with air sealing with these products. Um, if, if there's critics uh, to these products, it's generally, what I hear is generally, um, some people are just never going to come around to OSB, and some people are, don't, um, aren't happy with the reliance on tape with integrated panels, um, just haven't, don't have confidence in tape. Um, which I guess they might have the same problem with self-adhering products. Self-adhering products are um, also rolled out like mechanically fastened products, but they're, uh, they're peel and stick like, like flashing materials. Um, nice thing about self-adhering, again, you get that air sealing quality. They're great for remodels in that way where maybe you have old wonky board sheathing, but a lot of builders have adopted them for new construction now too. Uh, you can still lap your seams for, for that kind of positive shingle style. Uh, lapping and uh, keep keep in mind, like anything that's peel and stick, um, most of them must be rolled, and that's a super important part of the process of uh, of installing those. Uh, fluid apply products have come up come to us from the commercial building industry where they've been around for a while. They're generally sprayed or rolled um, onto a substrate. There's a whole bunch of different ways. Well. I don't think a whole bunch. So at least two different ways that the seams and flashings are detailed. Um, sometimes it is with a, um, a tape-like product or a mesh-like product that's rolled out before it, it's covered with um, with the fluid applied product. Sometimes it's a separate um, it's a separate seam sealer or gap filler that's used, um, and the, you can get these in different permeances. Uh, some some of them must be installed by a certified contractors, but I know that uh, a lot of builders are learning how to install them and having, having success with them as well. 
And finally, rigid foam. We put a lot of rigid foam on the outside of, of our homes. And uh, it's, it's not common, but many rigid foam products are approved. Um, and you can check with the ICC um, ES. The criteria there is AC71. You can check to see if, if a foam product is approved for use as a WRB. Um, and, and many of them are, especially a lot of the polyiso products with foil facing are. And, and this, this point is, um, is true of all, uh, actually true of all of the products that I've talked about tonight, but it's important to follow the manufacturer's installation instructions. And the, the, the reason for that is not only to, to um, so the manufacturer may be honor their warranties because, you know, because they know what they're talking about, but also because the products are tested, installed using the manufacturer's instructions. So if they pass tests, um, it's, 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 partially because they were installed, how the manufacturer is specifying that. So it's important with, um, with all of these products that you install them following the manufacturer's instructions. One of the big concerns with foam as a WRP is that the material is known to shrink. Manufacturers have worked pretty hard on that. Some of the products don't shrink, but we still hear, hear reports of rigid foam products shrinking and that can leave um, the, the uh, building vulnerable. Um, so those are, the, those are the categories. And then just a little bit about what people are actually using. Tyvek alone accounts for half of the WRBs installed on new homes. Uh, mechanically uh, fastened house wraps uh, add up to two thirds of all WRBs installed. Uh, integrated panels like Zip are, are on the move and so are self-adhered products. They're both approaching 10% of the market. You know, these were you know, not even known products um, 20 years ago. And then fluid applied products are a small uh, portion of the industry, but, um, but we're seeing more of them installed. Um, and one interesting thing from this study where I got this information is that, um, that any of these alternative products tend to be found on higher end homes and multifamily buildings, not on uh, production buildings. So just a few, this is kind of just a uh, summary of what the things that I just kind of cruised through trying to be as efficient as possible. Here are some of the things that you might consider when choosing a product. Of course, um, the costs vary a lot in this product category. Um, how they're installed, you know, from fluid applied to mechanically fashioned, those are very different installation processes. You want to think uh, about water first again, but you also can then start to think beyond water. What else do you want to try to control with your WRB? Um, the exposure rating is important. How long is the, is the product going to be exposed to the weather before you get siding on the house? And most of them have, for professional builders, most of them have more than adequate exposure ratings. For owner builders who are working slowly, uh, maybe not. That might become a consideration. Uh, you might It might be important to look at, if you're using a manufactured siding material, what the manufacturer specifies for a WRB. We all know that it's hard to, it's hard to make warranty claims on, on most building materials, but warranties can also be a sign of quality of a product, so they're, they're worth looking at. And then uh, finally, your overall water management um, strategy um, and how the WRB fits into flashings and, and these other things that are helping you manage water. And then lastly, just a couple of notes. I didn't really know where to slip these in. Um, there's not a whole lot of independent testing done on, um, on water resistant barriers. I'm only aware of one study that was done and it's, it's quite old now. That study um, basically warned us to be aware of perforated products. Some WRBs, um, mostly mechanically fastened products, get their permeance by uh, having small holes punched into the material. And in this study that was done at, at UMass a while back, um, probably 15 years ago now, uh, those products um, proved to allow more water intrusion than others. Um, I also, and this is, this is somewhat anecdotal, but there are um, a number of tests that are done, um, ASTM tests that can be done on WRBs to, to get their approval. And I believe the way that the testing works, unless it's changed, is that the manufacturer can choose from a certain number, of, certain of these tests to have their product tested with. And if they pass enough of these tests, then they get their approval. Um, one of the things that is not tested for is uh, what Peter Yost described to me as water held intention, which um, is Peter's way of saying basically water stuck behind the siding, stuck between the siding and the house wrap. And he said that he has investigated um, 
um, some houses. He does building investigations and he has investigated houses where the, the WRB has failed um, and, and good quality WRBs that haven't been installed for that long because water was not able to drain. And so what that comes down to is um, use a rain screen. <laughs> And this is just good advice in, in almost every climate and, if, and um, for a lot of reasons, but it's, it, there's one more reason to use it so that your WRB can, can do its job. So with that, I will turn it back to Travis. Yeah, thanks for that, Brian. That's uh, it's both insightful and broad enough that I think that opens up our discussion pretty nicely. Uh, I'm, I'm anxious to get uh, Jake and Ben involved just because these guys have seen so much in their <laughs> seen so much in their time. Uh, I would bet that they're not using the same systems now that they were maybe five years ago and certainly not 10 years ago. So I think it's a great opportunity to draw on their experience. And um, I'll, I'll just ask Ben, cause Ben, you're older than Jake, right? Should we start with you? What's the oldest system? <laughs> what, what did you I don't know. We're pretty when... close. We're we're within a year or so of each other. I forget. I forget. Um, what's the oldest system that I've installed? Uh, tar paper. Yeah, thirty pound felt. Um, you know, that's old school. That's uh, what Dad used back in the day. I remember uh, rolling that stuff out to put under cedar clabbered siding and stuff like that back when I was a kid. Uh, back in the late '90s, early 2000s, when I really started you know, being on job sites and getting paid for it um, was the rage of Tyvek really, really kind of hitting the market. Um, and we thought we were the, the hot shots in town when we went to a, a Tyvek reps demo and we already knew how to do an X cut for the window opening. We were, you know, we were cool kids. And then a couple of years later, we were Same the first to start using cap staplers and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, Tyvek and I've miles of the stuff I've installed. Um, so I guess there's one thing that I'll ask Jake is what in the process of building, do you worry about more than water? Is there anything? No, there's absolutely nothing. No. <laughs> I mean, I don't want it to fall down, but the code is written and engineering specs are written in a way that we don't have to worry about it falling down or catching on fire anymore. Uh, or, or we hope that it's not going to do that. <laughs> so after those two things, it's water. Maybe, maybe we could make that argument. Uh, but I follow the same path. I did. Uh, we did a lot of uh, grade D uh, paper. Have you ever seen that, Ben? The, it's the uh, it's impregnated like felt, and it's asphalt impregnated. But it is like rosin paper that's just been yes. dappled. Yes. <laughs> with yes. It's the worst. So I remember that from when I was a kid. I remember playing and trying to build origami things out of grade D paper. <laughs> And then I remember trying to build boats and float them in like buckets <laughs> yep. full of rainwater, that type of thing. Yeah. Yep. And then felt paper and the same thing. And I remember the guys at the lumberyard telling me that I was crazy the first time that I ordered Tyvex commercial D cause it had a crinkle to it. And when I ordered their flex tape and things like that, and then it's gone from there to, uh, you know, we're a big fan of zip system. I'm a big fan of Prosecco's, Cat Five, I've used Stowe's Gold Coat, uh, but I think that uh, I think that conversation about what's the thing you're the most worried about, water, starts not with what WRB you're choosing. Brian touched on it a little bit. It starts with the design and the execution, because I can make a house unlikely to leak water with Tyvek. It's installed properly and it has a rain screen and it has big overhangs and if the walls aren't getting wet from rain without anything on there then the product you put on matters a heck of a lot less and if you relieve that pressure and you give that drainage and you create that that rain screen behind it your system choice matters a heck of a lot less than if you're building no overhang houses with siding nailed directly to the WRV, right? So, so let me just throw this out there because I've, I've seen it already pop up in the chat box and I got the questions earlier in regards to posting, you know, notifications about this meeting tonight. Is there anything wrong with using tar paper? I don't think, I don't so, think so. If you're just looking at water, if yeah. you're trying to I, get an air control layer there too, then obviously that, you know, that changes, but tar papers works just fine. It worked for yeah. longer than any of the other systems that we're talking about. The, the thing, the thing that I will say though is, so tar paper functioned really well, you know, for decades. 
Um, my issue with tar paper now is that uh, it's not the quality that it used to be. So back in the day, tar paper was built or made with a high concentration of cotton rag. So it was a much more robust product. Um, you know, the 30 pound felt that you used to get back in the 50s and 60s, you know, if you've taken that stuff off of houses and then you compare it to the 30 pound felt that we get today, it's not the same product. So that's the why they don't even call down. it 30 pound anymore. They call it number 30. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because it's but not that, the same that, rating that, system, even. Which is that number thirty also means pound too sometimes. But yeah, it's they're playing all sorts of tricky little games. Um, my other concern with tar paper is is that it can be difficult to install. Um, if it's on the side of a building for any period of time, it's really susceptible to wind damage. Um, you know. It's Even UV using sensitive. cap staples and stuff like that, it's very UV sensitive, especially if you have it on a wall for a couple of weeks, it sees some UV and some, you know, heat and thermal cycling, you go back and you're trying to cut, you know, a head flashing in or something like that, it gets really brittle and it's kind of, it's cheap, but it's tricky and you, for, for how cheap it is, you lose that in the labor that it takes to really pull it off well. So the grand scheme of things, there's nothing wrong with using tie paper as your water control layer. It just doesn't have the benefits that a lot of these newer products have. Yeah, it lacks versatility. So, so uh, <coughs> go ahead, Travis. Oh, I was just gonna tee you up, but if you've got something, go. That's what you're here for, Ben. Come on, man. So, uh, yeah, so what I was going to get to is, so we're talking like in this whole class uh, of tar paper, these are mechanically attached sheet membranes, okay? So uh, something that I see a lot that irks me uh, is not using cap staples, okay? Um, cap staples are cheap. The tools are out there and they're easy to use. They're functional. Back in the day when, you know, the stingers first came onto the market, they were kind of a pain in the butt because you'd have to slap it and then pull the trigger to feed another cap. Now they're automatic. We've got, uh, you know, pneumatic cap staple guns that are just a breeze to use. Um, the thing about using the cap staple is it does two things for you. So one, it gives you a much broader area that uh, that staple is applying force to on that membrane. So when you've got Tyvek on, you know, or whatever sheet membrane you're using on the side of a windy house, it's going to be less likely for that membrane to flap and to create micro tears at each one of those little staple holes. So it's spreading that force out over a larger area. The other thing that it's doing other than spreading that force out is, is that little cap is actually forming a gasket. So when it's driven in properly flush and, you know, with the right amount of force and it's sitting flat, then it's actually creating a little gasket around that. Because if you take this, you know, sheet membrane and you put it on the side of the house and then, you know, I see guys going with hammer tackers and they're blowing thousands of staples into the side of a house, maybe not literally, but that's what it seems like. You're making all these little micro holes now for water to get through. So, you know, use cap staples, it's cheap insurance, you know, what are we talking about? 20 bucks or something like that? 40 bucks on a whole house or something like that for cap staples? Install these things with cap staples. And if you dig into the manufacturer's specifications for a lot of these things, most of them are specifically calling out that you have to use cap staples. And if you're not using cap staples, this is a shocker to a lot of people, they're calling out that you have to go back and have to tape over each one of those individual uncapped staples. Yep. So all right. I know it's going to be tough to get a warranty claim from any of these manufacturers because they've got a team of lawyers lined up. They're going to shoot it down for whatever reason. But if you're not following the specifications, you're just shooting yourself in the foot from the get go. Those, uh, all those little staple penetrations. I remember, uh, I think that it's Stebrick. And he, he was taught, I think it was Joe Stebrick. And he's like, well, I don't think it matters if you choose micro perforated or non micro perforated house wrap because you're going to micro perforate it by putting it on the wall. <laughs> and I was like, that is, <laughs> that is, that is a good conversation to have because all the systems we're discussing right now are mechanically fastened, even if they're fluid applied, because we're going to put nails through them or screws through them to mount stuff to the outside. So we do have to take that number of penetrations, the type of penetration, how it's gonna be challenged, we have to take those things into consideration as well. That's the argument for rain screen right there because those batten strips yeah. are then absorbing all those fasteners and you've, you've minimized those penetrations. Um, but that, that gets to a, the point that I was gonna raise next, which is um, so much of this is gonna have to be solved almost on the design side at the inception of the build. Um, Oftentimes we have the architect selecting the cladding or the, the owner uh, selecting the cladding 
And then in my mind, often the cladding dictates the choice of the WRB. Is that what you guys experience? Or do you feel like it's dealer's choice? You're the builder, you get to say what, how are you guys experiencing that selection process? Or is it more driven by the insulation or the interior and the permeability arguments? So I would say that my, uh, my process starts with uh, choosing to work with architects that are knowledgeable and helpful when it comes to these sorts of decisions. And I would also say that it also is my um, scope of work that gets written for every project. So if you want to choose that, that cladding, then we're going to make certain assessments in the design process that then may dictate other things in the build. And we're going to have the information at hand. It's not going to be like a spec build where you show up and the house has OSB on the outside and there's a pile of stuff to put EFAS on the house and a pile of stuff to put lick and stick stone on the house and a pile of stuff to put vinyl siding on the house. So controlling your risk is the first, I mean, that's another extension of design, right? Uh, for us, uh, it's really a response to the particular job at hand. Um, we don't, generally allow anybody else to have any input to the products or the methods that we're using for our envelope, um, you know, for water control, I'll say that, you know, when we start talking about thermal control and stuff like that, you know, the clients budgets and, you know, goals factor in, but when it comes to the water management, uh, rarely are we seeing our architects specify which WRB they want us to use uh, that type of system. So we're responding to the particular job and, you know, choosing our system from there. You know, if we're doing a, a renovation project where we're going over, you know, we're tying in an addition to something that has old board sheathing or we're doing a resetting job on something with board sheathing, then we're probably going to try, a, you know, to use a fully adhered product because that's going to allow us to get an air barrier at the same time. Um, you know, <clears throat> if we have just a quick little, you know, repair or something like that, replacing, you know, filling in where there was a window or something like that. Pardon me. Um, we'll it's okay. Go ahead. go ahead and we'll probably go ahead and <laughs> you want me to take that. <laughs> no, it is. That could be Don't interesting. Don't let us keep you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a busy man here. Um, <laughs> we'll go ahead and use a sheet membrane. You know, if it's just a quick little thing, we just need to throw up a little section and we can detail it properly. We'll use a sheet membrane. Other times we're using integrated panels like zip. Um, it, it's really all a response to whatever the job conditions are. Uh, the current new house that we're uh, coming down the home stretch with, we used uh, you know fully adhered Sega product on the outside of that. Um, part of that was is that uh, I like their products and wanted to use it and kind of get some more hands on with it because it's a newer product. Uh, it was also a response to the fact that this house is out in the middle of an open field near the coast and sees a lot of wind, so we wanted something that was going to be durable and deal with the job site conditions and not be flapping off the side of the house. So that was a factor in the decision-making. So it's for us, it's all a response to uh, whatever the conditions are. And it's really because that's our highest level of risk on the project. So we're not going to let anybody else have any say in what that is. You know, if somebody wants to come in and suggest that we use a more bomb proof method than what we're using, I'm all open to it, but we've never had that happen. So. Ben, was that my vest that you held up? Yeah, this is a uh, my vest 500. We're gonna pretend like nobody else is here. Does it stick well? Uh, yes, it does stick well. It does sticks. it stick well to OSB, or are you guys just using plywood? Uh, this went on to uh, just onto plywood, but I've done samples when this stuff first hit the U.S. They gave me a roll of it to play with, um, and we did some samples on um, OSB, and it stuck really well there was actually in the first roll that came to the u.s that we had a piece off of there were some issues with the adhesive delaminating from the product um from the facer but they've resolved that issue now um i like it i like it a lot uh there are some funny little intricacies that i learned with using this um you can't like wrap down the side of a building and around a corner you actually have to cut it at the corner and uh close that transition with tape or lap it over. And the reason for that is, is that the sheet membrane actually moves and expands. And when it gets to that corner, it's going to be a force point and it could potentially rip or buckle at the corner. So there are little intricacies like that. Um, but learning those things was kind of why I wanted to go hands on with this stuff. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's that iterative learning and just being able to absorb and learn the materials that much better. Um, Compared to blue skin, how does it, 
how does it apply? How does it how does it roll out? We're we're having an actual how do you do it conversation. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay. So no, yeah, so. there's a whole bunch in the chat box right now. Uh, the first one I saw come up was Proclima versus Sega. Then I saw Blue Skin. Blue Skin might have been a start. Okay. So I, I think okay, they want to hear it. So I have limited experience with Blue Skin, and I hated it just from an application standpoint. And I actually was having uh, I was. I was actually at Fine Home Building doing something and Gurton was helping me with it. And I said, is it always like this? And he said, yes, that's why I don't use it either. And I was just like, oh, okay. Like this is a finicky product and it's going to take time to get you used to it. Do you feel like that? Uh, it, it, my first job using it, like we've done a, a fair bit of blue skin. And that's where we've switched over to the Sega now. Um, is it finicky? N not really. Like, it's really, I, I don't see where the concern is with that. Um, it can be tough, particularly with blue skin. One of the complaints I have with blue skin is at low temperatures, which we see quite a bit of in Maine. Uh, and we always seem to have the, the fortune of scheduling our framing to happen in like January. Like, we need to figure out how to change that. But uh, blue skin can have a bit of a tough time um, in cold weather. Um, one of the other things that I'm not crazy about with blue skin is having to do a termination sealant joint at uh, reverse laps. Mm -hmm. So they technically want where you have their butyl flash or something like that. And it goes on to the product. You have to take and run a thin bead, a little smear joint of sealant across that to seal the top edge of that. Whereas with Sega's products and Proclima's products, um, they're self terminating. So that's just one less step. Um, I, or it's we, tape if you don't trust the self termination, right? It's still, I mean, that's better than having a caulking gun and a tool and a mess. Like if you don't yeah, trust exactly. that. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's another step that I, that's added to an already, you know, comp, not complicated, but it's, it's another step, you know, that I'd rather not have to do, you know, termination sealant joints and stuff like that. Um, I don't have a hard time working with it. It takes a little bit to get used to. Uh, favorite tools that we have for installing is uh, like a linoleum roller, I think is what they are. It's like a 10 inch wide three head roller with an extendable handle. And you can put the stuff up on the wall, kind of get it where you want it. And you can run right across and roll it out real easily. Uh, and then just normal little rollers and squeegees and stuff like that. The edge of your speed square works good to get into corners, that type of thing. It doesn't require anything special. Um, your first couple of goes with it, you know, it's like doing ice and water shield. Don't pull all the release paper and like until you know what you're doing. Um, some of them <laughs> coming onto the market. We've all I'm been picturing there. specific <laughs> incidents. <laughs> and we've yeah. all been there. On 90 <laughs> Get days. a beard stuck to it. Mine yeah, used to be yeah. longer than yours. <laughs> <laughs> until that faithful day on that roof in the 90 degrees. Um, <laughs> Some of them I'm starting to see, and this is like, hopefully I don't upset uh, my friends at Obdike. This is a piece of, like we were talking about before. This is a, I've heard these called drain screens, not rain screens. So this is that dimpled material that causes you to get better drainage. You're not getting convective drying, but you're getting better drainage. Um, and, you know, this is got, this is a peel and stick. This is new. I don't know if they started advertising it yet. But one of the suggestions I made to them, and I think they're putting onto the product, is, is they're putting like a one-inch release at the top edge of the roll. So what that means is you can just pull that one-inch release, get your piece Genius. set up to your chalk line, tack it in place, and then you can pull that full 18-inch or the two 18-inch strips. And it's, it's learning little tricks like that, or like tacking a corner, like we'll pull the release off at corners, and we'll like tack the two corners to get it right where we want it, and then you'll just reach underneath and pull all the release. Um, just one more and thing. You'll let us know if you get an here. email from Obdike. Yeah. <laughs> this is free advertising, I consider. It's really, <laughs> uh, it's a great product. I'm looking forward to this stuff coming on the market. It's pretty bomber. That, um, that drain wrap distinction, though, is super important because if we're talking about like no drainage, drainage, and then ventilation, there's a good, better, best. And I'm going to always push for best, uh, you know, so it's like, yeah, that's a, if you want to use that, that is a hell of a lot better than just using, you know. We use this, we, we use products like this. Um, 
particularly when we're doing like residing jobs where we're not affecting the exterior trim and we're just going back in where we don't have the physical space on the existing trim to build out three eighths of an inch or something like that. Um, so this is the best that we can fit without having to redo all the exterior trim on a house. Kyle's question is, do you think it's, there is anything to having those dimples behind the furring strips for better drying? No, that's a waste of time, Kyle. There's a house right around the corner from the shop here where they just did that. And I scratched my head every time I drove past it going, what the hell are they doing? But... A little extra uh, effort, not always well-placed, but always placed as long as it's yeah. charged for, you know, Hey. And uh, something else to respond to like the, the Proclima versus Sega question, like the whole question of what product uh, I'm pretty agnostic to what product I have ones that I, prefer but i think you should use whatever product you're comfortable with and that you feel you can get good support for so if you're if your local supplier stocks henry blue skin and you've got a rep that you can get in contact with then by all means use that you know it, it doesn't you know these are all and i'm gonna push products i'm gonna push for stocked locally is one of the biggest things that you can ask for because the first thing that happens is somebody goes, well, the budget's tight. I don't want to order an extra five gallon bucket that costs $600. We'll, we'll just, you know, if we have to get it, we'll, and then people are standing there waiting to put on siding and you're still working on WRB because it was supposed to be done two weeks ago. So, I mean, that's, that was the original reason that I went to cat five from Prosico for a couple of remodel jobs it's because they're in Kansas and the worst case scenario was I could, that wasn't a good thing for Kansas. That was a company happens to be located there, Travis. No cheering. Uh, it counts. It counts. Like the worst case scenario is I could physically drive there and back in a day if I had to. Like that, there, there are no, I, I, sorry, there are one, Stowe's Gold Coat is available in my market because it's available at the same place that sells concrete uh, products for some reason. And uh, I just didn't like its workability when we used it you know it seems to be doing just fine i drive by that house all the time i got out and looked at it two or three months ago while the neighbors were outside staring at me like i was breaking into the people's house it, it appears just fine but it was a pain in the butt to work with so that goes to the same thing that ben's saying it's whatever you whatever you and your carpenters are most comfortable with i think there are three words that i i always bring up with this discussion um uh, and certainly with selections on my projects. Uh, it Are they the has... and an A? <laughs> no, they're, they're more complex than that, Jake. Write, write okay. these down slowly. <laughs> ben, you'll understand this. Stay with me. It's Let me get a crayon. Yeah. Compatibility, cost, and reversibility are three things because I, I started in this industry as a remodeler, and I tend to continue to be mostly a remodeler. I'm always thinking about reversibility, and that, I think, speaks to environmental, environmental responsibility as well. But cost usually is the one that wins out over most everything else anyway. But for me, compatibility and reversibility are pretty high up on the list. Uh, so when I hear Ben talking about, well, you know, I like this tape from Sega and uh, whatever, blue skin, I, I always wonder, I realize that I'm not going to ever be able to make a warranty claim that actually pays out to solve my problem. But I do uh, want to comfort my client that, hey, we thought about this. This is a system that works together. There isn't any issue. And I need that to be more ironclad than I called my rep. The guy who wants to sell me the product says it's okay. Is okay with that? Right. So if you guys would speak to those three things or in any smaller words that you also understand, Jake, however you want to address it is fine. Well, compatibility is, an, is, an, is a word that I haven't heard before. No, I'm just, uh. <laughs> Try a ask your ask your wife about it. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor in the house. I think that 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 those are conversations that we have with all of our building materials. I mean, I know that uh, you know, especially Michael and Emily and Ben are pushing for spray foam to go away. If you're looking at reversibility, that's the easiest question you can you know that's the easiest one you can point to. It's a horrible thing to have to go back and touch you know, can we find a WRB that allows us that a little easier? Uh, that's part of what I like about zip is because I can cut that tape. 
I can I can run a saw through it and then adhere back to it if I need to. It's also kind of what I like about the Cat5 product because we actually have added on to a Cat5 house, a Prosco Cat5 house, and all we did was coat back over to it and Prosco said, ah, give it a couple feet worth of overcoat and, you know, to make sure that it ties back in. And then that way, if you have any, if it's been damaged where you were working, you know, if you're prying on something, you're getting back to stuff that hasn't been affected. So, I, you know, without knowing those words, I guess I was doing the same thing. Uh, on that same compatibility front, um, it's just a, it's just a little passing thought is um, making sure that if you're using adhesive products or using flashing tapes, that type of stuff, um, is to make sure that they play well with the materials that it, are also in the assembly. Um, personally, I, I don't want to, you know, ostracize anybody's products, but I prefer acrylic and all acrylic uh, for most of my stuff because they're worry-free. They perform well. I have another and that's why I was asking about it sticking, that, that my vest sticking to OSB. I, you know, my my market would support us going to my vest. I would prefer that it be available locally, but I can get by with, uh, at the end, the guys at Sega are fantastic about getting stuff out quickly. I don't know if upgrading the sheathing to plywood is going to be something that's easily available in my you don't have to. houses that we're doing most of the time. Yeah, you, you and so don't that's have what I was to. like, hmm. trying to get no, stuff you... to stick to OSB is tough. Yeah, I believe no, this you. stuff. This stuff sticks great. You know, you didn't believe me a while ago about fen trim sticking to concrete. Right? Yeah, I believe you. Yeah. No, it's, it does. It really does stick great. And it does. And it works well in cold weather too, you know. I, yeah, it's acrylic. It better it's if it's from great. Sega. <laughs> while we're talking about fully adhered membranes too, um, I sometimes get pushed back on fully adhered membranes because it's apparently more of a pain to adhere them to a second story like real great when you're doing a one-story house um we do a lot of panelization half the time our panels come with it already on which is awesome um but but what's been your experience uh staple up versus fully adhered on more than a one-story building everything sucks on the second floor that's my response <laughs> putting windows in on the second floor sucks too like it's it's worse when you're on the roof like no, that would be my conversation yeah it's i guess not, i don't building houses we're not building toy cars on the on a workbench that's yeah, an awesome get, response i don't get i don't i don't understand the pushback really because it's if you're building your walls or especially if you're doing panelized you can put the stuff on and you're just running it down to the bottom course of your sheathing and what's the worst case scenario you got to get up and tape one joint at your you know your rim joist there you're gonna have to do that with anything else anyways so it's do it just like curve. the zip and put it on before you stand the wall up you know, that's what we do. We try and do as much when the walls are sitting on the flat as possible. If we're standing walls. Ladder so we set. did a, uh, a remodel where we yanked all the siding off. We put a little bit of the addition on and then we pros code the whole house. And at the time zip wasn't available in our market without special order and neither was Prosico. And so we made the call thinking that there was OSB on the whole house because it was built in the nineties that we would just pros everything. And then we started ripping siding off and we realized that there was OSB every 24 feet and on the corners. And it was like, oh shoot, we should have, we should have just used zip. We should have ordered zip for the whole house. And so then we got one whole wall off, stood there and looked at it and we went, okay, we're going to drape this side of the house and we already have the Prosico on site. We're going to pre-coat all the panels before we put them up and then just go back and hit nail heads. And so we basically used Prosico to make zip panels to then mount on the wall and then go back and detail the seams. And it was like, this was not the way we wanted it to go. This is not the way we saw it going. But I remember one of my carpenters standing there going, aren't we just making zip? <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't say zip on it. I just watched a commercial site right down the road from us that's going up. I think they were probably trying to keep some of their carpenters busy with shop time while we kind of figured out working situations up here. And they're installing all their dense glass and it's pre-coated with uh, not the Cat5, but uh, the MVP from Prosico. And they did, looks like the exact same thing. They pre-coated their sheets. Either that's that funny. or they don't want to hire a waterproofing company to come in and spray the whole thing. Who knows? But I think we're going to do it yourself. Zip system. 
<laughs> I think we're going to get into some more of the questions from the chat box in just a second. I know Brian's been watching those closely, but real quick, guys, I think that it is important if we want to make broad sweeping change in our industry that we do have to kind of address the builder production uh, or the production builder mindset. And those guys are used to uh, having a guy on the lull with the nine foot roll stretching it all the way across the house. So those are the guys that are making the argument, oh, this is hard to work with on the second floor. And it's just because they're not used to working with a four foot section and then moving the ladder over. And then, so that's really, I think, hey, this whole thing slips up and down and I can hammer the hell out of it with my stapler and everything's fine. Those guys are already hard to win over. So then when we talk about cost and we talk about access and ease of use for your undermanned crew that doesn't have the access that they should or the safety equipment that they would need or the proper staging. I'm, I'm always reluctant to exclude those guys from this conversation because we want to bring them in. We want to get everyone building better. And so I guess the, the argument then would be uh, if you can get them cost wise to just say, Oh yeah, hire your painter to shoot Prosico all over it. Uh, Cause then that's easy and you don't need staging and you don't need this or that, or now it's your painter's problem. Or maybe there should be W, uh, excuse me, maybe there should be WRB subs who just mm -hmm. apply peel and stick that are set up for that. And by doing a volume of that, they can get their price down. I don't know. I just, I wanted to throw well, that in before we move on to the chat box questions. Welcome to the commercial construction world that already exists. Yeah. You have waterproofing subs, make, that's what they do. Make ventilated cladding part of the code. Well, and then it matters right. less. How about we? every piece of siding has to go on on a rain screen? Sold. Uh, we I, I we did make I, it. Yes. <laughs> There's a... I, I just get a note on that, Travis. There's a down here in, in Charleston. There's a there's a lot of um, <clears throat> sort of you know residential con re multifamily residential construction. You know, um, it's it's all city infill, so it's hard to describe what it actually is. It's not quite townhomes, and it's not it's definitely not single family. It's somewhere in between. But I see a lot of crews that come in and, and do do fluid applied WRBs. As soon as the building's ready for it, a crew shows up, they, they spray it, they pull, and then they're out of there. So that's something that I've noticed a, a, a whole bunch down here now. Well, that's super South, encouraging. Sorry. The, the South seems to do that a lot. You know, it's something that was foreign to me, but I have friends down in Florida. It's their sheathing crews. Like, that's it. That's oh, all yeah. they do. There's framers, <laughs> and then there's sheathing crews, and then there's Tyvek crews. So I, I think the reason we're getting pushback from uh, these production builders is it's just in the way that they've beaten every dollar out of the model. You know, if you've got your framer and he's framing and sheathing and throwing the Tyvek on the wall while it's on the deck, then what's the issue? You know, but it's because they've driven every little penny out of it that they can. They want, you know, the, the framer's giving them the cheapest price because he doesn't have to touch the sheathing. The sheathing guy's giving them the cheapest price because he doesn't have to touch the WRB. The WRB guy's giving them the cheapest price because he doesn't have to touch the siding. So you're and well, never gonna win, we're never going to win with that model, so. If you and look at what uh, shows up production, puts a hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> what production builders are starting to do with Aero Barrier? That's a crew that comes in and handles specifically one small aspect of the job. You know, I think it's. I think we're less than a decade away from trailers that have spray rigs on them that they come in and they sp spray a bitumen on the foundation and then switch to a different gun and just keep spraying up the wall and then they backfill and siding goes on. I think it's so, coming too. So um, in that way, I, I want to just sort of point the, the conversation. We've had this question a couple of times now, but point the conversation towards the WRB and specifically their ceiling qualities. So questions come up a few different ways now, but, but essentially they're asking what, what products have, have you had the most success with specifically when it comes to your lowered or tests and your lowered or results? My best successes have been with zip system and drywall. Uh, so I don't give zip system all the credit because drywall is carrying a big part of that load. Uh, but that is probably because that's the thing that we use the most. Uh, and I think that while we're getting really low numbers all the time with it, uh, if you're, I think that I, Ben and I actually had this conversation. If you're under one ACH 50, you should pat yourself on the back and, and go home happy. So you don't no, have if, to worry if, about if under passive under, house for most of the time. 
if you're under one and a half, you're doing great. Like below that, I think we're splitting hairs. Yeah. Um, my, my best success is my lowest number is actually uh Sega tape on OSB with a second layer of my vest over it. That was also taped. Um, and I've also, I've had great numbers with zip as well. And but if you look at what Myron Myron's doing, Myron's getting really good numbers out of just drywall too. So then mm -hmm. we're back right. to felt paper and drywall. Sure. So, so let's, I guess let's talk about like different ways that you can get air barriers with your WRBs. Um, you know, you can use integrated, you know, products like zip panel or the force field or uh, what's the other one? Uh, weather Doesn't logic, matter. the LP, the weather logic, the one that's out now or dense element. You can use those integrated products and tape the seams and get really good results. And you kind of have killed two birds with one stone there. You've done your, your water control and your air control in one product. Uh, another method that I'm really big fan of is just whatever you use for sheathing, just go back and tape the joints in your sheathing. You know, uh, 3M8067 tape is a good lower cost all acrylic, Sega, any of the tapes that you believe in, you can just tape the joints in your sheathing and then put a mechanically applied over top of that. That will get you great numbers. Um, you can do fully adhered. Uh, fully adhered, you know, it's kind of somewhere in between the two systems. It's still a sheet that you're putting on, but it's still a continuous air barrier across the whole um, structure of the house. So, uh, like I said, th those really, I, I think the place that fully adheres really, really shine is in remodel work. Um, mm -hmm. Where you're tying in or you're going back over, you know, existing sheathing and it might be all chopped up and funny or it might be board sheathing or whatever you can just put that on and it gives you a really robust air control layer without you having to spend a whole bunch of time detailing out little areas. And it's a bomb proof weather resistant barrier if installed properly. You know, what's so interesting to me about what you just said, Ben, is that, um, you know, this audience is probably, you know, mostly, you know, custom builders, architects, and people working on, on you know, high performance homes or maybe, you know, curious homeowners or owner builders. But what we know, I mean, I said it in the, in the uh, earlier presentation is that uh, two thirds of homes have mechanically fastened WRBs on them. And I, I also know that 75% of homes are insulated with fiberglass insulation. And so I think that I, I, it just struck me that the, the, one, of the, one of the most significant things we could do to improve homes across the country would just be to take the seams of the sheeting. Mm -hmm. That's not getting done. All those houses, that two thirds and 75% just tape the sheathing. Yeah, and everybody in the high performance world likes to slam fiberglass, um, and it's for good reason. Fiberglass is really a terrible insulation if you allow air to move through it. But if we can stop or minimize the amount of air flowing through it, it's not a bad choice. You know, bang for the buck, it's pretty good. So, like you're saying, one of the best things we can do right now is to just figure out how to air seal our buildings, and then it really doesn't matter what you put in there, as long as it's put in well. Mm -hmm. I think that that, uh, and I don't have it in front of me. I, w I wish we would. I would have figured that we were going to talk more about air sealing. There was a uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab study, and I see Coda in the comments. Maybe Coda knows it. Uh, a few years ago, that said like if we took every house to just three ACH fifty, we'd save like twenty billion dollars in electricity in the United States. And it's like if you just took it to code minimum, we'd save twenty billion dollars in air sealing. I think we have a huge opportunity in this country if we can figure out how to do things with aero seal and existing structures or, you know, I don't want to like advocate for legislation enforcing something, but when there's a transfer of property through a sale or something like that, that we can go in and, you know, blow aero seal inside of an existing structure, we would do so much for the energy efficiency and performance of our, you know, our grid just by doing that. It, it, you know, it's what they were trying to do with weatherization right for decades. Get the right people at the energy co-op and offer a, a rebate. Hey, next time this house sales, we'll give these people $2,000 towards the purchase of that next house. Uh, someone just asked about the um, ICCES reports. And I, I think I, I think I alluded to this, but I'll just, uh, just share again that those um, ICCES acceptance criteria um, that all of these products are um, either, a, a, you know, either rate approved, approved by um they 
unless this has changed, I believe that there are a number of ASTM tests, uh, so a whole slew of tests that a manufacturer can put their product through, have, have, a, have a lab put their product through, and as long as they, the, the, um, as long as the product passes the test that they chose to put it through, then they get their, yep. they get their code approval. So it's not, it's not apples to apples. You can look up this information, but you know, the, those acceptance criteria aren't, aren't, um, they're basically not telling you that a product is good. They're just telling you that it passed the test that the manufacturer chose. And, and what, is, you- what is, what does ASTM stand for? Another, Another stupid, stupid test. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Yost was telling me the other day that one of those test methods is like you build a boat out of it and you put a yes. marble in it and you put it in a, bu- a thing of water. And then the test method is actually written so that it's not supposed to take place for longer than 90 minutes or something like that. And it's like, oh, so this only works if your house, the whole exterior of your house dries in an hour and a half. Like the, the cladding never holds any moisture. It never rains for more than an hour and a half. The, the sprinklers never run for more than an hour and a half. And, it's, and as soon as he said that, I was just like, oh, I have to look up what the testing method is in the code book. And today I called a friend and said, hey, will you send me that again? And I was like, oh, I didn't even realize that it's just for felt paper. I had read the code before and was just like, okay, well, we're judging everything off of felt paper now. Yeah, ASTM testing methods, if you got you know 75 bucks or 150 bucks to spend on buying you know, one of their publications. They're, uh, they're really phenomenal learning experiences, uh, incredibly boring and nerdy, but they're, you know, a lot of polished great. stainless steel. Oh, God, all sorts of things. Yeah. Diagrams of caulk cross sections and uh, yeah. Yeah. But like, it's really, it's great. Uh, what I'm driving at is, is to, to dig into these things, look at the code and see what the code is referencing and then go online and see if you can dig up a free copy of the ASTM method or uh, even ask some of your product reps. A lot of times <laughs> you'll be able to get ASTM copies from some of your product reps so that you don't have to pay for them. And it's really uh, phenomenal learning to just wrap your head around what the product's actually doing and, how you can manipulate it because really what this all comes down to is, is, is material manipulations for all of us is it's learning the materials well enough for the intricacies of materials well enough that we can make them do what we want to do. Um, you know, manufacturers will have their guidelines that they want to see us install to. I generally, I'm sorry, everybody, I throw those right out the window. I'm going with what I believe in. And that's just drawn on 20 plus years of hands-on experience with materials. And I I urge you to do the same thing, but do it by doing your research too. You know, you can't just go willy nilly and just start putting things together. You should have some backing for it, but you need to be choosing products that you believe in, not installing things in a way that a manufacturer tells you to. Sorry to all the manufacturers reps that are here. Was, but. Ben, was that a eloquent way of saying, I've been doing it this way for 20 years? No, that was him saying, we've put testers in the wall and we've checked this and we've double checked this and we've taken things apart and it's, we, no you know. it's it, it's it's empirical knowledge we all get it if we're hands-on in the field we shut up jake you're off the christmas card list buddy uh, this is the comment i came here for this is exactly <laughs> the exchange i envisioned uh when we were talking i think i'd hear you're off the Christmas card list three times in one day, but it is happening. <laughs> no, side note, <laughs> uh, our text messages, Jake and I back and forth on a pretty regular basis. Are, oh, God. Well, I would I be remiss. Nobody, I hope email. nobody ever gets to read those. <laughs> we won't make them public here tonight, but I would be remiss in my duties of uh, trying to fill in for Mike as the host uh, if I didn't reference his comment in the chat box where he asks if we want architects and designers specifying our WRB <laughs> materials. What do you guys say to that? Depends on how good the architect is. Mm-hmm. I have no Doug problem when Steve Basic specifies it for me uh, because we're going to agree on it most of the time. Uh, I have another architect that is relocating, so I don't mind saying something bad. I will not let him specify anything. He doesn't even get to pick windows. I also, I, I know some really phenomenal architects that just don't know the products because their job in the residential world isn't knowing the products. Some of them do, there are very good architects out there that do, but the most of them are more attuned to, to other things. Um, so 
Linking back. The, ar the architect's a little bit of slack here. As the architect uh, uh, representing here today uh, and linking back to the article that Justin just wrote on fine home building is I think there needs to be kind of a blend in between that. I obviously am going to write what WRB or equivalent I want on some of my stuff, but I'm unique to the institution. And I also believe in integrated design. So if Ben and I are building a project together, Ben's in a design development. We're talking about like, hey, what kind of sheathing are you using here? What are we doing? Like, what's our double stud wall, et cetera. And so we kind of already agreed and he doesn't need to look at my detail. Um, and Justin had mentioned in his article, like architects need to put more of these details in there. But I just heard both of you saying that neither one of you is going to look at what I wrote on there anyway. So uh, it goes back to... Uh, you know, he was mentioning putting a QR code on some of the some of the product materials, you know, if you specify something. But, man, maybe architects' drawings need to have QR codes that just link to a video of installation of some of these things. You know, like, let's take the, the whatever out of it and just say, like, hey – here's this thing I said you should use. Here's this eight minute video that says how you install it or what's available locally. And um, talking to the Vermont group, they're really good at what they have available locally. And as an architect, you know, we should know more than we do. And so I'm sorry for your experience, Jake. Uh, <laughs> we should, we should know what's available locally. We should be in that point and we should both you, the builder and the architect be able to draw that line that says, this is where the WRB connects and how they connect together. And I know, uh, it came up on your Unbuild It podcast and Steve was like, I should know those details and I should be able to say it's not on the manufacturer, but maybe there's some wiggle room there as to what the builder knows, what the architect knows and what the manufacturer knows to have the best project. Yeah, it's a I team. Yeah, I, I would love to see more architects specifying these things. Um, really just from my end, because then it means that they've thought through the whole assembly. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, architects, but a lot of them have a bad habit of just, you know, worrying about negative space and line weight and, you know, form and all of that and forgetting that, you know, this thing's supposed to be beautiful, but if it doesn't last, then it doesn't matter. So it's just, I'd love to see details like that from more architects to show that they've kind of thought through the whole process. You know, I, one thing that drives me up a wall is architects refusing to put gutters on houses. Like, come on guys, stop. We, we, you know, we have to get water away from buildings. I can tell you stories where I, from seeing the prints, I told them this is going to be a problem. And then the day the clients move in and they get a rainstorm, they go, we've got a problem. It's like put gutters on the house. Um, okay. Then I'm the going to, I'm going to share. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. I yeah, sorry. I'll just wrap this up quick. The other thing is, is I'm not going to totally ignore what architects put on the prints if they do put those things on there. I'm not throwing them right out the window. Some of uh, my favorite assemblies I've put together were totally drawn down to the finest detail by architects. And I learned a tremendous amount and learned materials from them. So uh, it's not, you know, it needs to be that conversation. And the sooner we all get into this together and have these conversations, the earlier in the process, the better. So I agreed to do some consulting for a builder in another market with an architect in another market. And we scheduled a Zoom call like this. And uh, I introduced myself and, you know, I said, I, I write for Fun Home Building and a couple other publications. And this is the podcast we have. And if you want to learn more about me, our Instagram is a good representation of how we feel about building. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? And the architect said, I'm here to answer your questions. Can you just answer your questions? And I was like, oh, this is not a, this is not a team. This is not a team approach at all. I was like, uh, you know, and so I cut the call that was an hour to like 10 minutes and then just called the builder and said, I'm going to give you the stuff and you can take it to the, to the architect. And he's like, I don't know. I was like, yeah, that's, that's when we have a problem is that when nobody's willing to work with each other and, and be part of a team. Bad on my profession for sure. I mean, there's plenty of builders that act the same Our way. I'm going to do it the way I, I've been doing it for 40 years. I have to deal with it in my company because I bought the company from my parents. And while my dad said he was retiring, he's worked for me, I think, seven different times in 12 years. <laughs> and every one of those times ended with, I've been doing it this way for 40 years. So I get it. 
<laughs> well, and, the, and you, you guys, we have two, we have two, you know, um, seasoned high performance builders sharing here. And I have also had the experience of um, publishing houses and working on um, stories on, on high performance houses for fine home building, where um, it was the builder's first crack at um, at a high performance home or an energy efficient home. And when I asked how how it was, one of the comments that I got a lot. Uh, was that it was great because they were used to getting um, six pages of plans from the architect. And on this project, they got 67 pages of plans. And so that made it really easy. So it does, we have, we have, we got two builders here talking, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of architects that have been doing this for a while and they're going to be the ones training the builders possibly who haven't done this work yet. So it's going to, it's, it's just whoever, if if we're open, doesn't matter what side we're on um, of the workflow, if we're, if we're open to learning, and, and when someone has more experience and we're willing to learn from them, then it's going to work. I absolutely agree. It's a two-way street. And I've said that from the beginning, you know, integrated design, everybody's going to have something that they've tried, they've done differently, um, you know, and, and ways that, <laughs> that work. So if we could just be open as an industry to working together, we're going to have a lot less risk and way better projects. I always use the three-legged stool analogy too, where it's client, architect, and builder, because the client also has to live there, pay for it, and be happy. Uh, well, again, Jake, I think that's perfect. That's great because the other thing that has always blown me away is how how much on, on really great projects when I interview the homeowners, how much they know about their project, how much they know about their house. It was like, wow, they had a they had a good relationship with their architect and their builder. Yep. Yeah. They cared to be informed. Also, from a builder standpoint, the client that is informed and willing to pay full price is the client that's going to be happy with what you do because they value what you bring to the table. Here, here. The other builders in the group agree. Uh, there's an awful lot to be said for a client who um, trusts their builder. Uh, I mean, it's a two-way street for sure, but there's... There's just so many opportunities for the client to support the process and everything that they put into that, they get back many fold uh, in performance, comfort, uh, just the attitude of the workers on site, I think daily makes a difference in the quality and durability of the build. Yeah. Do we have I any just, more questions? I just want to. I wanted to point out really quick um, because people uh, have a tendency to drop off right around this point is uh, there's been some great conversation in the chat box. And if you want to save the chat box, there are three dots on the bottom. You can save the chat from the chat box um, as a text document uh, afterwards. So anyway, back to the discussion. I, I, uh, if we, if we can, we can take one more question before we, uh, before we close it up, I, I will, ask one of the most commonly um, asked questions on GBA about, uh, about WRBs. And it, it's, a, it's an odd question, so I'll be interested to see how you guys answer it. I answer it the same way that you guys do. So the question is this, boil, boil down the question is this, um, I need to choose between uh, zip system sheathing for my WRB, which is less than one perm, or Tyvek, which is rated at 58 perms. What should I go with? The more vapor open WRB or the vapor closed WRB? Ben, you want to go first? Where do they live? (laughs) (laughs) What's the rest of your wall look like? Uh, Yeah. Do you have plastic Uh, on the inside of your wall? So down south, yeah, like climate zone one and two, go ahead. I'm more inclined to say lower perm is better. Um, and then the further north you go, the more permeability I want to see on the exterior. And what's the permeability of OSB? Two. It varies. Wet, wet cup to dry cup, it's like 1.1 to 3 point something. So So what, you cover it with matters at the joints? <laughs> <sighs> no. The thing, the thing that, yeah, is... It, if you're putting OSB on the wall, you're really not going to be able to affect the permeability. So uh, like Jake talked about before, we we're building with CDX plywood now because we want a high permeability assembly because we want drying in both directions. Um, your, the permeability of your wall is only equal to the 
to the lowest number in that assembly. So if you've got OSB on there, you're not getting higher than three perms in that wall, no matter what you do. You can put an, you know, an 80 perm house wrap on the outside of it, a 300 perm house wrap on the outside of it. doesn't matter. It's only going to be three perms. So. Uh, just but it also depends safe. on where your WRB is too. If you're going to build a two by four wall, put a zip system on the outside of it and then put 20 inches of insulation on the outside of that. Do we not call that vapor open in both directions? If you're using a vapor open insulation on the outside, like there's, there's, it's not a simple yes or no is, is the actual answer, Brian. Right? Uh, yes. I think Emily has whichever one, whichever on one you think is going to work. Yeah. It That's my favorite podcast statement. It depends. It's, it's a good answer for all this. Well, I'm glad that, I, that you guys, it, you, you alluded to all the things that, that I, tend to bring up and and the 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 question seems flawed to me because you know you osb is i mean zip has the os zip is osb and wrb and you can't compare that to just the wrb so i was pointing to well what's your sheathing and you know what what's the permeability of sheathing and to go from there do you have a copy and paste answer for that <laughs> i have a few copy and paste answers i don't know if i have that one done yet <laughs> <laughs> you got to start your own website like Christine did for uh, for overdriven fasteners. Still one oh, of my God. favorite things. <laughs> yeah. It just something because I've got it sitting here next to me to like, you know, we we're talking, you know, Brian in the intro talked about how many products there are out on the market. Uh, this is a little sample thing that I just got from Rotho Blast. Um, they have just in monolithic membranes, 40 or 39 different membranes. Like you want to lose your it's mind. More choices on than, than colors you get on windows. It's true. It, it, it's just, it, but each one of them serves its own purpose. So, you know, if you've got open joint cladding, they've got ones for open joint claddings that are going to withstand UV. If you've got, you know, high temperature applications with metal siding over top of them, they've got ones for that. If you want low perm, high perm, da, 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 big money, little money. There's a lot of options out there. So more stuff to play with. Thanks for coming, Doug. Yeah, I was going to say, it's Bye, yeah, Doug. a few more minutes, but that's that's almost the perfect sum, summation, Ben. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of options out there. I feel like we really solved some things tonight, folks. Thank yeah. you for tuning in. <laughs> Hopefully everybody left confused. I feel like yeah. we made that clear as mud. Yeah. Live in a tent. <laughs> Keep the water out. Yeah. That really is the... Okay. That is the, the essence of it is choose something robust, install it well, detail it properly, care the whole time you're doing it, and everything will be fine. Um, at least that's, that's my, my final thoughts. I guess this is the time in the show where everyone shares their final thoughts. Uh, so go around the room. Jake, share your final thoughts. I think it's pretty clear. Good design trumps just about everything else. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Jake. And Ben? Uh, try not to suck. So, sorry, I hate to be crass about it, but just try not to suck. That's really it. Try and give up a, you know, part of my language, try and give a shit about what you're doing. You know, try and do the best that you can on that day with what you have at hand, and that's all you can ask for. You sound like my grandmother. <laughs> Her beard was not nearly as long, Jake. Be fair. No, have you seen any pictures of her? <laughs> <laughs> Not with clothing? Is that what you're supposed to say now? Maybe, <laughs> it all falls apart. Maybe we should, maybe we should cl close out by saying, Ben and I actually do like each other. Oh, <laughs> we're all friends here. Uh, okay. So I would sincerely like to thank you guys for, for taking the time to join us. Uh, I think this was an excellent uh, deep dive and broad strokes. We, we covered it all. It was a lot of fun. As Emily, actually, Emily, why don't you reiterate, how can the conversation continue? The conversation can continue. Uh, Green Building Advisor will post the replay of this on their building science blog on their website. And uh, if our hosts and guests are congenial enough, they will continue to answer your questions <laughs> over on Green Building Advisor <laughs> uh, or continue to uh, chat with each other. The chat box was very lively tonight. So um, feel free to continue the discussion on the Green Building Advisor blog uh, when the 
repost is up, Brian, probably tomorrow, maybe Monday at the latest. Yeah. Thank you everyone for, for joining us and uh, continue the conversation. Uh, Mike and I had this conversation on WRBs prior to COVID-19 when we couldn't get together and uh, it ended the same way with the, uh, it depends. Does that sum it up for you too, Brian? Yep. All right. I think we've, I think we've, I think we've said plenty. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thanks again, everyone. Have a great Good night, night everyone. everyone.